Hi and good day. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I'm Venla Bernelius from the University of Helsinki, a segregation researcher. And next we're going to have an absolutely wonderful panel on questions of segregation. And the first presenter that we have, I have the honor to ask for Judith Kende, who is a social psychologist from the Free University of Brussels. And she is extremely interested in her own research in questions of contact and integration and intercultural relations. So please, Judith, come to the stage. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thanks also for the invitation. I will be presenting research that we've done on the role of integration policies um, and how they are the key, inclusive integration policies are the key to low xenophobia in countries, regions and institutions with high immigrant presence. So my talk ties very nicely with what uh, um, the High Commissioner was describing before me on their work. I'm also very excited to be here because it's work that really speaks directly to policymakers, to people working in think tanks. So I'm, I'm also excited about the discussion and your questions and comments at the end. Um, I'm currently working in Brussels, but this is research that I did while I was in Switzerland at the University of Lausanne, and I was part of the NCCR on the move, the National Center for Competence and Research, focused on migration. And I'm also mentioning this because the work that I'm describing today is based on a paper that we published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, but we also wrote a policy brief um, specifically for policymakers, practitioners, and that's available on the website of the NCCR on the move, if you would like to read it. Um, and our starting point was a concern that many politicians share. Um, here you see an example from Theresa May, the former British Prime Minister, who, and I chose her quote because she put it very succinctly, she was saying, when immigration is too high, when the pace of change is too fast, it's impossible to build a cohesive society. Um, you could hear many politicians making the same argument raising the same concern across Europe and also overseas. Um, there are also some social scientists arguing that higher diversity would inevitably harm social cohesion. I copied here the abstract of a paper by Robert Putnam, an American political scientist. It's a paper that's been cited 6,700 times. In scientific terms, that means it's a superstar paper. So it raised a lot of interest. Um, and what Putnam was doing in this paper, he was showing that in the US, higher residential diversity meant that people tended to hunker down. Um, he used this term, hunker down, meaning that people withdrew into themselves, they were volunteering less, they were cooperating less with each other, they were trusting each other less, and they also had less contact. Um, in other words, what Theresa May and Putnam are suggesting is that higher diversity or higher immigrant presence would be inherently threatening for the native majority who experience this income of immigrants or, um, or increase in the number of ethnic minority members. Um, and this kind of threat would lead to higher xenophobia, so stronger negative attitudes towards foreigners, which is um, always a problem for social cohesion because it will lead to higher tension, it will lead to hostilities, it would lead to discrimination uh, against immigrants. Um, but the actual empirical results are inconsistent because this is a oh, I can because this is a um, question of such huge societal importance. There have been literally hundreds of studies looking at the link between immigrant presence and xenophobia, and they found in some of the studies that there is a positive link, so that higher immigrant presence is indeed related to higher xenophobia. Some studies found just the opposite, that more immigrants 
in a country region institution are related to lower xenophobia, and still others found no relationship whatsoever. Um, so we don't really know from an empirical perspective what the relationship is. And there was an influential review by two sociologists 10 years ago, by Portis and Wikström, who reviewed the literature on uh, diversity and social cohesion, and they concluded that uh, studies suggest that it is not diversity per se, but unequal diversity that makes a difference for social cohesion. And they suggested this 10 years ago, but it hasn't been tested empirically yet. Um, and because they set this focus on inequality, um, it also means that integration policies, in this case, immigrant integration policies, uh, especially the socioeconomic and legal ones, could play a role in, uh, in creating social cohesion in the presence of immigrants, because these are the policies that regulate immigrants' economic, social, and political rights vis-a-vis -vis the native population. Um, and we know from previous studies that when, um, also the High Commissioner mentioned some examples, that when states implement more inclusive immigrant integration policies, then immigrants would have more equal status in society compared to the native population. For example, they would have more equal educational qualifications, they would be more equal occupations and earn comparably, um, and they would participate more politically. Um, so what we did in these studies that I'm going to present to you now, we looked at whether the combination of inclusive policies and high immigrant presence would predict low xenophobia. And this could actually go two ways if you think that for the native, if you take this idea on board, that for the native population, immigrants are inherently threatening, the presence, high presence of many immigrants is inherently threatening, then you could also say that it's especially empowered immigrants who are threatening because they are the ones who will take away the jobs, they are the ones who will achieve the comparable status. So it could be um, what is especially threatening for the native population and what would lead to higher xenophobia. But there is another line of argumentation where you could argue that inclusive policies that lead to more equality for immigrants and the presence of many immigrants would result in the lowest xenophobia. Why would that be? The first thing that these inclusive policies could uh, engender is that natives have more contact with immigrants. My colleagues will speak a lot about this in detail after me, but you can imagine that if immigrants have more equal socioeconomic positions, they are more present in all walks of life, Hence, natives will have more contact with them because they are present in all uh, parts of society. They wouldn't be segregated to low-skilled jobs. They wouldn't be segregated to poor neighborhoods. They wouldn't be segregated to worse quality education. Um, apart from this, natives would also have what we call more extended contact with immigrants. So even if they don't know somebody personally who is an immigrant, they would know somebody who knows an immigrant, and that is also related to lower xenophobia, lower prejudice, we know this from the literature. Um, perhaps most importantly, if immigrants are empowered by uh, inclusive policies and they are in more equal positions, then natives would have contact with them as equals. Um, so they would meet immigrants as their neighbors, as their colleagues, as their doctor, as their teacher. And this is something that's very robust in the social psychological literature, that it's especially contact among equals that reduces prejudice, that reduces xenophobia. And finally, the High Commission also touched upon this. Um, if these policies are empowering immigrants, then natives would see immigrants more often in counter stereotype positions. So by and large, the stereotype of an immigrant, who of course doesn't exist, but the stereotype of an immigrant is somebody in a low status position, maybe on welfare, but if the policies empower immigrants, uh, then the representations that you see in the media, in culture, of immigration, of immigrants would also be um, more egalitarian, and this, we also know from the literature, that this can additionally reduce xenophobia. So, 
what we were doing based on these theoretical um, foundations was that we tested whether the relationship between immigrant presence and xenophobia would depend on immigrant integration policies. Uh, and we expected, you can't see the bottom, that's a bit awkward, we expected that we would find the least xenophobia on average in highly diverse countries, regions, and institutions where there are more inclusive integration policies, and the, conversely, the highest levels of xenophobia in highly diverse countries, regions, and institutions where the policies are less inclusive. Um, and we wanted to test this at different levels of context because immigrant integration is regulated uh, at different levels, at the levels of countries, at the levels of regions, and also at the levels of institutions. And we focused on socio-economic and legal political policies because we were interested in empowerment. So we didn't look at cultural policies um, that are also relevant in other respects. And we did a very large-scale study. We did altogether eight uh, parallel studies with 140,000 native participants. And we used data from 66 different countries 20 regions and 64 institutions. Um, first, we did six studies comparing different countries. We replicated it several times because we wanted to make sure that the results, the findings are really robust, that it's not just one kind of survey or one kind of comparison of countries that uh, produces this result. So we used, some of you might be familiar with the surveys that we used. We used the World Value Survey, the European Social Survey, and the International Social Survey Program. Um, we picked those surveys where we could uh, look at some measure of xenophobia, where we could identify native citizens, and where we could match the survey data to corresponding policy measures. Um, we also did two studies at the subnational level, only two because there is much less data available on subnational policies. We did one comparing Swiss cantons and one um, comparing schools in Belgium. This is the list of all the studies. I'm not going to go into it. It's just if you, you have any questions later on. And uh, I will briefly show one of the predictors we used, or one of the ways we captured integration policies. I'm sure some people in the room are familiar with the MIPEX. Um, it's an index of immigrant integration policies um, that ranks the policies of all EU member states and the countries that you see listed there in different um, domains of policy, labor market, education, political participation, access to nationality, family reunion, health, permanent residence, and anti-discrimination. And before we show before I show our results, I will take a small detour, and I will show you where Estonia is on, uh, on the MIPEX. The latest scores are from 2019, so there might have been, that's been published by uh, the people who uh, collate the MIPEX index, so there might have been some small changes since then. As you can see, um, the, the index goes from zero to 100. The, Integration policies are very inclusive when it comes to labor market, mobility, family reunion, education, and access to permanent residence, but a lot less so when it comes to access to health care, to the political participation of immigrants, um, and to access to nationality. And they are in the mid-range when it comes to protection from discrimination. Um, at the same time, when you look at the changes in policies over the years, all of these, you can see that all of the scores have gone higher, so policies have become more inclusive over the years, or at least they haven't gotten worse, which I find is a very um, promising arrangement, because I will show you the results now. We find very consistently that it is the combination of inclusive integration policies and high immigrant presence that relates to the lower, lower xenophobia. So what you see on the right is the results from one of the eight studies, where we compared 20 different countries using the International Social Survey Program. And what you see is that higher scores mean more xenophobia, more prejudice. And if you look at the left-hand side, the red line shows that when policies are exclusive, 
then levels of xenophobia are fairly high. From 0 to 100, they are at 60 on average. These are the results of the statistical analysis, so it's not one specific country, it's the overall pattern. In contrast, when policies are inclusive, and there are many immigrants, maybe I'll just go there. So in contrast, when policies are inclusive and there are many immigrants in a country, then overall the pattern is different because you see that levels of prejudice are almost 20% lower, which is, if you think about how this translates into everyday interactions, into social cohesion, this is considerable. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the, the same study, but plotted in a different way, where I have a dot for each country um, that, we did, that we included in the analysis. And you can see that the countries here, where you have a lot of immigrants, like Sweden and the United States, but the policies are very inclusive. That means we, we indicated this with the stronger colors of green. And you can see there that the levels of prejudice, the levels of xenophobia are quite low. And in contrast, you have other countries where the policies are exclusive, indicated in red, and their levels of prejudice, xenophobia on average, are much higher. Um, we find very similar patterns in all of the eight studies. Also, when we look at um, policies and xenophobia at the regional or the institutional level, um, and you might ask them, okay, so immigrant integration policies make a difference for xenophobia, but doesn't it actually stand in for something else? Isn't it because these countries are richer or because they are more equal or because they are more liberal? Isn't there something else? So we tested a lot of possible other explanations to see whether the integration policies would still make a difference. Um, we checked whether it would be about the country level of wealth, and no, it doesn't explain away our results. We can replicate these findings over country level GDP. Um, we checked whether it would be about inequality in income in general, and it's not. We have the same results when we also take into account the Gini index. Um, would it still matter? Would the policy still matter over competition for jobs? And we can see that they do. So we could replicate the findings over the unemployment rate. Um, we also checked whether it would be about just about rights and liberties in general, and not specifically policies that relate to integration, but, would, but that was not the case. So we could replicate over an index of rights and liberties. Um, the, you could also say if there is a very salient anti-immigrant discourse, then policies might not might not work, but that was not the case either. We looked at uh, political parties' discourses in relation to immigration, and the, the policies still mattered over these discourses. And it, they even mattered when it was a country that generally had a fairly anti-immigrant climate, so where in general people were more prejudiced. We used um, attitudes aggregated from other surveys to test this. So, in sum, what we found in these uh, studies was that the link between immigrant presence and xenophobia depends on the policies. Um, more specifically, that natives express the least xenophobia in high immigration contexts when higher immigrant presence is coupled with inclusive Im immigrant integration policies because these policies render immigrants more equal to natives. And in contrast, we found that natives are the most xenophobic when immigrant presence is high, but the policies are exclusive. So Portis and Wickstrom were, were right. It is not diversity per se, but unequal diversity that makes a difference for social cohesion. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Judith, for your inspiring presentation. This was also an excellent introduction in many ways to the themes of our next presenter. I have the pleasure to invite now Dr. Patrick Kotsur from the Durham University. So we, with Patrick, we continue the theme and the discipline of, of um, social psychology.
And Patrick is interested in what factors and processes shape how we respond to people who we feel do not belong to us. So we continue very strongly on trying to understand what creates prejudices and kind of social distances and social perception. So welcome, Patrick, to continue. And while Patrick is coming here, I will just briefly say that, that please write down and save and think about all the good questions you have, because you also then in the panel have the possibility to ask our wonderful panelists. I have written down dozens of questions already, and I hope you do as well. But please, Patrick. Hello, and um, my, my name is uh, Patrick Kotzur. Uh, I'm affiliated to Dome University, and I'm part of the segregation panel. Not because I'm going to talk about segregation, but I, because I'm going to talk about the direct opposite, taking also a micro perspective. So, uh, in my talk, I'm going to talk about the benefits of intergroup contact and how this might not only shape how we perceive other groups, but how this might actually also shape different or other aspects of society. Um, and um, in particular, um, in this talk, I want to look at uh, with you today uh, at the topic of social fear of crime, or that is uh, kind of how we worry about crime in society. So, um, at the moment, of course, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is on all our minds, and I think rightfully so. But you might also remember, just a few years ago, we had the refugee crisis, um, or a refugee crisis uh, already, if you will. So in 2015, millions of people from Syria fled, um, fled the country, many of them coming to Europe, many of them also coming to Germany, where the set of studies that I'm presenting here today is based. So let me elaborate a little bit more on the context. When you asked participants of national representative surveys um, back in 2015 how they felt about immigration of refugees in society, then the majority, in this particular case, 57% felt that immigrants might actually increase crime rates, and, and in particular immigrants um, referring to refugees. Some two years later, still a majority of people in this case, 60% uh, in the survey here still felt that way. So um, that actually maps quite nicely on a concept that has been studied in criminology, which is the concept of fear of crime or the worry about crime uh, in society. So there are different aspects of crime uh, or worries about crime that people have been looking into. One aspect is the fear or worry about crime as becoming a victim of crime oneself, um, which criminologists, criminologists often, look, uh, often look at. Uh, but sometimes um, the focus is also on social fear of crime, which is a different facet. And here, this concept taps into um, how I feel about um, crime in society, so whether I worry or do not worry about crime in society. And basically, um, how we can interpret these polls here is that participants actually expressed this fear of crime in connection with the presence of a minority group in society. Whoops. Um, now, when we look, however, at the data, uh, we can see, for instance, here, this is data um, here in the ear. Oh, sorry, this is the one that you see. I see a different one here. Um, so when we look here at the data, for instance, in 2015, between January and November 2015, the blue line represents the registered uh, immigrants. The orange line represents the immigrants that are suspects of crime. We see a high increase in the number of uh, immigrants over the period. However, the orange line is not increasing to a proportionate extent, which might mean that the cold fact data might actually kind of uh, contradict or, or contradict um, our subjective feelings about crime. So um, perceptions and reality might actually be diverging. <laughs> 
And this is actually also something that has been shown time and again in the literature, that the actual crime rates don't necessarily correspond to how we feel about crime. So for instance, here in one study that was conducted by Belgian colleagues, they looked at police criminal records and also feelings about crime or fear of crime, and they found no substantial relationship between these two constructs. So now given the gap between cold, factual data and how we also feel about crime, we were asking ourselves, okay, so what might actually be drivers of these perceptions? And how can we maybe also reduce these perceptions as um, these perceptions might be not proportionate to the actual problem? When we turn to the literature, there's actually also um, quite, uh, yeah, quite something out there that we could look at and that can give us some hints um, regarding um, what might be drivers of this perception. One of them is um, the threat literature, which suggests that, for instance, um, how we feel about immigrants, about minorities, such as, for instance, refugees, um, is closely related to threat perceptions. And um, we know that threat is emotionally experienced as anxiety or fear. And, um, which is already or are already constructs that are quite closely related to something like fear of crime. We also know from the personal fear of crime literature that prejudice towards groups is also connected to fear of crime. And we know that um, the relationship between prejudice and social fear of crime is stronger if the target of prejudice is criminally stigmatized. Um, so in order to show that, we have conducted a study which is still in preparation, in which we asked 300 people that we, we could get our hands on in pedestrian zones and other public areas to kind of tell us, okay, um, which stereotypes which are prevalent in society can you think of about two groups? The one group, was refugees, that, which we hypothesized to be associated with crime or criminally stigmatized. The other one was homosexuals as a sexual minority, which we hypothesized to not be criminal, criminally stigmatized. When we analyzed uh, the data, we could see that a majority of people could reproduce stereotypes about refugees that were related to crime. So 60% felt that refugees might be perceived as criminal, breaking the law, or being thieves, something along those lines. A minority felt that homosexuals were perceived that way, and that's a significant difference. Later on, we also showed quantitatively, looking at correlations, that the association between prejudice towards refugees and social fear of crime is much stronger than the correlation between prejudice towards homosexuals and fear of crime. Something that we also know is that prejudice at least partially causes social fear of crime. And uh, how we showed that was, again, uh, in, a, still, uh, in a, a study that is still under preparation, we asked the same people eight weeks apart um, to fill in questionnaires about prejudice towards refugees and also measures about uh, social fear of crime. And then we looked, okay, which of these two constructs is going to predict which of the other two constructs over time? And what we found is that indeed, prejudice towards refugees, or those that reported higher levels of prejudice towards refugees at time one, reported higher social fear of crime at time two. Whereas we didn't find such a relationship for those that reported higher social fear of crime and prejudice at time two. So this tells us that over time, prejudice might actually be leading to more social fear of crime rather than the other way around. Okay, so now that we know that prejudice or how we perceive some social groups in society is related to social fear of crime, how might we, how might we actually be um, able to reduce social fear of crime? Here we based um, our research on Alport's intergroup contact hypothesis that Judith has also already uh, touched upon um, the idea that prejudice can be 
produced by good or positive intergroup contact. Not all contact is positive and good. There's also negative contact out there, which is why we felt, okay, it might be the case that negative contact might then actually have a social fear of crime enhancing effect. So we were asking ourselves, okay, can social fear of crime be reduced by positive and increased by negative intergroup contact because of changes that this contact um, affects on, or affects on, on prejudice? So what we end up with is a model here where positive intergroup contact towards group X affects social fear of crime via affecting prejudice towards group X. For negative intergroup contact, it would be the opposite relationship. And this should especially be the case if the group is criminally stigmatized. And in our work, we looked at refugees as such a group. Just to say that we used uh, established measures, I won't bore you here uh, to death to, uh, with these details, but if you have any questions about them, I'd be happy to talk more about them. So what we did, we ran three studies in which we looked at the relationship between these variables, one being a cross-sectional survey and two experiments. In the first, uh, first cross-sectional survey, we asked 300 participants to simply fill out questionnaires in which we asked them items about the constructs that we were interested in, positive intergroup contact, negative intergroup contact, prejudice towards refugees, and social fear of crime. We then fit the model that we hypothesized to, to get a feeling for the relationship between the variables. And indeed, as hypothesized, those that reported higher positive intergroup contact with refugees reported lower social fear of crime, which was explained by lower prejudice levels. The opposite relationship was found for those that reported higher negative intergroup contact. So um, from a research perspective, yay, um, this is already quite promising. However, one limitation, it is merely a survey study. So from the design, we can't really see what the causality between these constructs is. So is it really contact that causes social fear of crime and prejudice, or is it that social fear of crime might, me, might actually, um, yeah, for instance, uh, have me uh, engage in more negative intergroup contact and um, less positive intergroup contact. Which is why we conducted study two, an experiment, and here we uh, capitalized on the idea that is in the literature that mentally simulating intergroup contact experiences is or has similar effects to actual face-to-face -face intergroup contact. So a random half of our participants imagined a pleasant and positive intergroup contact experience with a refugee. The other half was asked to um, imagine a walk in the park. And uh, just to say that we did not look at negative intergroup contact here because we didn't want to experimentally induce negative intergroup contact with refugees for ethical reasons. But indeed, those that imagined a pleasant interaction with refugees later on reported lower social fear of crime levels via reductions in prejudice towards refugees. Um, so that was actually also um, quite interesting to us. One limitation, of course, imagining one's prejudice and social fear of crime away seems a little bit artificial, doesn't it? Um, and what about also this group specificity, Patrick? that you promised us. I mean, up until now, you've only shown us data about refugees. Which is why we uh, conducted study three. In study three, um, we actually had people engage with one another. So we invited participants uh, to a conversation study, 80 university students, and um, we told them that they would be talking to another student. Um, what we didn't tell them, that they would be engaging in somebody who was employed by us. So uh, a confederate who, in the one condition, um, introduced themselves as a refugee, in the other condition as a homosexual person. We then had, engage, uh, had them engage in a pleasant intergroup encounter using an established paradigm, the fast friendship procedure, which consists of answering questions about different things, increasing um, the intimacy between those uh, that are engaged in this interaction. 
and it's been shown that uh, to also reduce prejudice um, when this interaction is with an outgroup member. And indeed, what we could show is that those that were under the impression to um, be interacting with a refugee as opposed to a homosexual person reported lower social fear of crime via reduced crime-related prejudice. And the way that we did that here was we um, buried some items in a long questionnaire in which we asked participants to what extent they felt homosexuals and refugees were perceived as aggressive, criminal, and um, things along those lines. And uh, so for refugee, it worked quite well. When we plugged in the measure for homosexuals, though, this model crumbled, so we didn't find any relationships among the variables. So for us, that's evidence that indeed there's a group specificity here. This only works if the group itself is also stigmatized as a criminal. Summing up, we asked the question, can social fear of crime be reduced by positive contact and increased by negative contact? Um, via changes in prejudice? Well, based on our little series of studies um, that we conducted using um, surveys and also uh, using experiments, we would argue, yes, intergroup contact consistently affected social fear of crime levels via prejudice levels. Now, would any outgroup do? We would argue, no, intergroup contact can help reduce social uh, fear of crime if the outgroup itself is also criminally stigmatized, then intergroup contact can unleash its power. And with that, um, our study is one of many now emerging studies that show that intergroup contact does not only affect attitudes towards other groups, but can also affect other outcomes that we value in society, um, such as, for, uh, for instance, reduced social fear of crime. So when we go back, um, to the question with which I started my talk, how can we actually reduce social fear of crime, then indeed having people engage in positive intergroup interactions with groups that are criminally stigmatized, such as refugees, might be a good idea, and avoiding negative contact might be a good idea too. Of course, there are uh, some limitations and ways forward for our study, um, which I would also be happy to expand on later on, if you want. Just to mention briefly, we only looked at refugees and homosexuals, um, so we didn't look at other groups. This is also German data, so it would also need some rep replicating in other contexts, and we didn't manipulate negative contact for ethical reasons. And now also with the Ukrainian-Russian war, it might be also that this might change how we, for instance, perceive groups. So the prototype of a refugee, when people think about refugees, might also shift. And with that, I want to thank all of my collaborators who've been um, busy collecting all this data. And thank you for your attention. I'm, look for, I'm looking forward to our panel discussion later on. Thank you, uh, Patrick. That was very on point also to the question of segregation, which we will also look then more deeply into how to kind of unsegregate. And to, to that theme, we also have our next speaker, who I have the pleasure to invite, Dr. James Lawrence, who is a senior research officer at the Economic and Social Research Institute, associate professor uh, at Trinity College and an honorary research fellow at the University of Manchester. And for all of our speakers, as you notice, they are extremely well linked to different organizations and internationally. And if I would read out loud all the awards and prizes they have gotten, we'd be here tomorrow. So just with this very short introduction, welcome, James. Great. Um, so, first of all, just thank you very much um, to the Integration Foundation for inviting me to talk to you all today. Um, and thank you all for coming, too. It's, it's really wonderful to see so many people 
engaged and interested in um, questions of social integration. So well, well done, all of you, for being here. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, interpreters uh, who will be interpreting me. Um, I will try to talk slowly for you so uh, to make your job easier, but apologies if I run on. So um, today I'm going to be talking about um, what really kind of shapes people's um, attitudes of prejudice, their inter-ethnic attitudes, and in particular, the kind of role of uh, the ethnic diversity and the residential segregation in our towns and our cities and our communities. How does this shape people's views of um, other ethnic groups? So by way of a... Um, brief uh, introduction to this kind of idea. Um, obviously, we all know that ethnic diversity is increasing um, across Europe and globally, in fact. And we're at some of the highest levels of ethnic diversity that we've seen uh, in history in many ways. And in the UK, where I do a lot of my own work, between the last two censuses, we saw the proportion of non-white British increase by about seven percentage points, which is actually a huge, huge number over just a period of 10 years. But interestingly, um, in 2019, they did a, a census of um, the ethnicity of births in the UK. And they found that 40% of uh, mothers identified their child as non-white British. So in many ways, this kind of increasing ethnic diversity that we're seeing is really baked into most societies across the world. It's only really going to increase. So tackling these issues is hugely important. So at the same time, though, we've had a kind of emerging concern that potentially we're re-entering a period of heightened inter-ethnic tensions. And there's lots of examples of this we can find across Europe, but perhaps there's two recent ones which are quite interesting, the elections in Sweden and Italy, where we've found the rise of, you know, populist rights, sometimes at times far-right parties, with explicitly anti-immigrant rhetoric. So... We have on one hand increasing diversity and we have on the other this kind of rising concern. And so potentially people are arguing that, well, we may be entering a kind of period where there is a social, political uh, and cultural backlash, at least amongst certain sections of society and at least during times of societal stress. So this leads to the kind of key question that we're going to be talking about, which is, well, what impact does diversity in people's communities and cities, how does that shape their attitudes? So very briefly, thankfully, uh, my colleagues have alluded to these uh, questions already, but um, how does diversity impact attitudes? And on one hand, we have the positive contact hypothesis. And the idea here is that as diversity increases, people's opportunities to come into contact with different ethnic groups also increases, and there's very good evidence to show that this kind of positive contact has a strong negative effect on prejudice. So under this idea, increasing diversity should actually be good for societies. At the same time, there's something called the threat hypothesis. And this idea is that, well, as a kind of majority ethnic group sees the size of the ethnic minority group growing, they start to feel increasingly threatened. They feel that their jobs might be threatened, their access to welfare might be threatened, and they may even see that their own cultural heritages are threatened by this new incoming culture. So you have this kind of juxtaposed, counter, counterposed uh, uh, set of theories, basically. So what does the evidence show? Well, very briefly, it's very mixed, as we heard previously. So on one hand, studies have shown that increasing diversity and immigration can increase prejudice, it can increase inter, um, anti-immigrant anxiety, and this is especially in areas experiencing rapid demographic change. And there's also been evidence to show that social cohesion weakens under situations of increasing diversity. But then, at the same time, other studies have shown no effect, and some studies have shown that people living in more diverse environments are actually more positive towards ethnic outgroups. They experience less anti-immigrant anxiety, and this is often in kind of more stable, diverse areas. So we have a very kind of mixed evidence base. So then, there is one kind of issue with a lot of this work, and it's that most of the research in this area really just asks the question of, well, what, how does the size of the ethnic minority group affect people's attitudes? 
What this kind of uh, misses, potentially, is the role of segregation in this. And because the problem is, is that just measuring ethnic diversity alone really gives no indication of how segregated an area is. And I'll, I'll give you a, a quick uh, example of this. So, first of all, we're going to see a community transitioning from homogenous to highly diverse, but this community is going to become increasingly residentially integrated over time. So we see that over time, the area increases in the percentage ethnic minority, but then at the same time, this ethnic minority group is increasingly spread out across the area. To the extent that we have, at time point five, a highly diverse community, but that is highly integrated. Everybody's equally spread out. So let's just um, compare this to an alternative situation, a situation in which diversity is increasing at an equal rate, and this is a key point, these communities are going to be equally diverse at every time point. But at this scenario, we're going to see residential segregation increase over time to the extent that at time point five, we have an equally diverse community, but in this situation, it's highly residentially segregated. So it's important to kind of stress this idea. Both of these communities are equally ethnically diverse. And if we were just looking at, well, how does ethnic diversity matter for attitudes, they would be treated as the same. But in reality, as we can see, they have huge differences in the spatial distribution of groups, their levels of segregation. So what we were interested in is we suggested that, well, potentially how living in an ethnically diverse community, a town, a city, impacts people's prejudice may actually depend strongly on how segregated these areas are. And in situations where we have a diverse integrated area, there may be lots of contact, threat might be lower, groups are less concentrated together. And in these situations, increasing diversity may actually yield better inter-ethnic relations. It will only be, we suggested, in these highly diverse but highly segregated areas where problems may emerge. So this is what we then set out to do. So to do this, we um, took lots of social surveys that were available at the time, which capture people's attitudes towards different ethnic groups and their levels of prejudice, and then we matched this to data on the composition, the diversity, the segregation, the socioeconomic balance of their neighborhoods and their cities. And then using this, we could see how attitudes would differ over different levels of diversity and segregation. So let's start in this situation just by looking at um, outgroup trust. So people were asked how much they trust ethnic minorities. And here we have on the left-hand side, we have the measure of trust in ethnic minorities. It goes from low to high. And here along the bottom, we have the, essentially the level of ethnic diversity in someone's community. So it goes from low percentage non-white British up to high percentage non-white British. So what we find is that as the level of ethnic diversity increases, people's trust in ethnic minorities decreases. They get more suspicious of um, ethnic minority groups. But, and so in, the, in many ways, this kind of uh, provides evidence for this threat hypothesis, right? But the problem is, as we saw, behind this kind of average level of ethnic diversity, there are going to be big differences between how residentially segregated and integrated the areas are. So let's now look at the impact of diversity in residentially integrated areas. And what we find is that, again, we're looking at trust, low to high. Again, we're looking at ethnic diversity, but this time we've divided communities by whether they are residentially integrated. So these are the areas where everybody's mixed in equally. And what we, we find is that there's actually a positive effect. Um, it's small, but it's positive. So people in ethnically diverse integrated areas actually have more trust in ethnic minorities. But then when we turn to looking at the impact of diversity in segregated areas, we see a very strong negative effect. So here, as diversity increases, but where groups are very separate from each other, people's trust in ethnic minorities decreases very significantly. And it's just important to kind of recognize here 
Both of these communities are equally ethnically diverse. There's the same proportion of minorities in them, but they have vastly different levels of inter-ethnic attitudes. So we can kind of replicate this across a lot of different measures. I'll just briefly talk here. Here we have a feeling thermometer measure where zero means people feel very cold towards ethnic minorities, and 100 means they feel very warm. And so this is a kind of classic measure of prejudice used in the literature. But again, we see the, the exact same relationship. And we actually see in this case, as the level of diversity increases in residentially integrated areas, people actually have less prejudice. They have more positive attitudes towards ethnic minorities. They feel warmer. And this relationship is significant. But again, we find that as diversity increases, but areas are more segregated, prejudice gets worse, attitudes uh, get worse. So, very briefly, so far we've just been kind of looking at the world in a cross-section of time. But the problem is, when, uh, when we're looking at these issues of neighborhoods and communities, people can move, people are always moving around. And people move because of their attitudes as well. So, what we wanted to do was isolate people who were living in the same communities over a, like a 10-year period. And then we would see how their communities were changing around them, and then that way we can discount these potential other uh, factors such as people moving around different areas. And so what we actually see here on the left-hand side, we see how people's attitudes towards ethnic minorities changes over a 10-year period. So here it's getting warmer, and here it's getting colder. And then we have the change in the level of non-white British over time. So these are areas that are changing to become more diverse. And again, what we see in areas where areas are becoming more diverse, but also changing to become more residentially integrated, people's attitudes get more positive. And again, we see that as areas change to become more ethnically diverse, but change to become more segregated, their attitudes worsen. And this is the same people in the same communities seeing these changes occurring around them over time. So this gives us much more a confidence, let's say, in the findings we were showing. OK, so this begs the question, then, why are we finding this kind of polarizing effect of diversity dependent on how diverse, how segregated a community is or not. And if you'll remember back at the start, we had these two theories. We had the contact theory, that as an area becomes more diverse, contact increases and prejudice decreases. But then we also had the threat hypothesis, which was as an area it becomes more diverse, people's threat increases and their attitudes worsen. So what we were interested in is, well, potentially, these relationships, these mechanisms, let's say, might not just be conditional on how diverse an area is, but also on how segregated it is as well. So here we're looking at the relationship between ethnic diversity and on the uh, left-hand axis, we're looking at the percentage of people who say they have uh, a friend from an ethnic minority group. So first of all, we're just looking at this relationship. How does ethnic diversity affect people's inter-ethnic contact? Strong contact, this is. This is a friendship tie. And we find that in these diverse integrated areas, levels of contact increase in a linear fashion with levels of diversity. So in integrated areas, the more diversity is, the more kind of positive contact people are having. But when we look at this relationship in segregated areas, we find, to be sure, at these kind of low levels of diversity, contact does generally start to increase. But then this quite quickly peters out, and then we actually find contact starting to decrease over time. And this potentially suggests that in these diverse, segregated areas, not only are people not having, say, opportunities for contact, that they are in these diverse, integrated areas, but also that this kind of wider segregation that may come in terms of people's institutions, their schools, their civic spaces, their social spaces, might actually work 
against further contact even happening. So again, it's just critical to kind of note that both of these areas equally diverse, equally highly diverse, but vastly different levels of contact. And as I'm sure you can probably guess where I'm going now in terms of the impact of diversity on threat, so I'll just kind of go through this relatively quickly, we find that in diverse integrated areas, again, uh, there is very little effect on people's perceptions that ethnic minorities are a threat. But in diverse segregated areas, we find that increasing diversity really means people start to view ethnic minorities as threatening about their culture, about their political status, and also about their economic status as well. So, just to kind of wrap up then, we find that the increasing uh, ethnic diversity on people's attitudes, people's contact, people's threat, is highly conditional on the level of segregation in the area. And so what this essentially suggests is that, well, there's nothing really inherently antithetical between cohesion and positive attitudes and ethnic diversity. Ethnic diversity itself can be a relatively positive when it occurs in integrated areas, but it can also be negative. So it's not really ethnically, ethnic diversity itself doing the work, it's very much levels of segregation. And we find that a good, a good explanation for why attitudes are much worse in diverse segregated areas is that contact is much, much lower. And this is likely, as I said, just because people live separately from one another, they have less opportunities to kind of come into contact. But segregation also creates segregation in our wider institutions, our schools, uh, even our workplaces. And so this residential segregation is leading to greater restrictions of contact across people's lives. And it's this which explains a good part of why we find tension so much higher in those areas. There's also the idea that people tend to use spatial segregation, how segregated our communities are, as a kind of heuristic, as a kind of indicator of group difference. So if you live in an area where all of another ethnic group live in one neighborhood and all of your ethnic group live in your neighborhood, then in your mind this barrier is going to become much stronger and through that, you start to see the other ethnic group as increasingly different from your own. And that's another kind of idea that potentially this is why segregation is really shaping people's attitudes in these diverse areas. But as I was showing earlier, this process is also something that is occurring over time as well. And this is something that occurs around people who are living in these same neighborhoods. So insofar as processes of segregation can not only be arrested, but also reversed, these processes can in turn then change people's attitudes to become more positive. And on that note, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. And yes, please do get in touch um, in the future if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, James. And this was also a wonderful introduction to our next presentation. We're moving to geography. And of course, in James's inspiring talk, you heard that space matters. So, so this is not only a social phenomenon, but also about how people live and interact in space and how those, those processes matter. So our next speaker is Karin Torpan, who is a PhD uh, researcher, PhD student in both the University of Turku and University of Tartu and a lecturer here in, in Estonia at the Military Academy. So we move into geography and housing choices and, and housing careers. Please, Karin. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm very thankful for James to really explaining uh, why uh, housing uh, is also really important uh, um, 
uh, when it comes to integration, not only the daily basis contacts, but also where is our home. But I must say that I'm a bit nervous, but it's really nice that uh, we are here, all here for the same reasons. We all have the same questions and we want to solve something. <laughs> so so uh, let's do it together and uh, I will explain a bit uh, about my uh, studies um, in geography and in integration uh, topics. So uh, I'm, I'm writing an article uh, which is about uh, uh, three welfare uh, countries uh, and more specifically uh, Helsinki, Oslo and Stockholm. And we want to see uh, that uh, what is the difference uh, uh, from residential disadvantage in different housing regimes. And, um, and I have uh, good colleagues from, uh, from these countries as well. Uh, so, what is the motivation? We have heard a lot about uh, why this kind of uh, research is uh, important. Uh, but um, uh, one uniqueness uh, of, of my study is that uh, I will look at uh, both the housing and uh, neighborhood uh, mobility jointly. So uh, where the immigrants uh, first come to a new uh, society and uh, how do they involve uh, in, in some years living already in this uh, new context. And uh, we want to see what kind of uh, strategies uh, they have and, uh, and how, how these um, locals and immigrants uh, can get more together. Um, yeah. Okay, for that I'm asking three nice uh, and big questions. So how income, uh, raise of income uh, could um, help them to exit uh, disadvantage, uh, residential disadvantage, so, and uh, kind of achieve some sort of residential integration. And then we want to see how it differs for uh, immigrants from different countries. So for that, we group them into three groups of uh, different wealth levels. And then uh, we want to see how it, the integration varies uh, between uh, the three cities, which are all welfare cities, but uh, still there are differences. Um, our kind of uh, framework, or where we, uh, where we stand, is that, uh, uh, is that uh, what is uh, spatial assimilation uh, framework. So basically, they say that, or claim that, um, uh, quite easily, that uh, if uh, the immigrant, uh, when moving to a new environment, a new host uh, country, uh, soon uh, if their income increases or they uh, get a higher socioeconomical status, they uh, will move to closer to locals and, and there will be a integration, easy. Uh, but let's see, uh, is it uh, really that way or is it so, so simple and how it differs? Um, yeah, so there are several factors that uh, kind of um, move, move or kind of um, uh, constraints um, also the immigrants. Uh, so basically there is this individual factor, so maybe these uh, immigrants don't want to really integrate, they prefer to live close to their own group, uh, own culture, uh, it might be just a temporal phase, so they will just, uh, maybe after graduating they will go to uh, abroad and earn some money to kind of build their own life in, back home. 
but uh, this can also be that uh, there are differences uh, or this kind of different um, factors that um, the income is uh, still low, that uh, this is the only thing that you can afford. And this comes back to this kind of uh, institutional or, or um, this kind of more con contextual uh, issues, for example, discrimination. So that um, uh, they don't meet their, uh, meet their preferences because they are kind of pushed into something else. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, then they can afford, and um, everybody needs a roof uh, on their, their heads. And then also this uh, collective discrimination practices uh, might happen. Even I have experienced it uh, um, when uh, looking for a home in uh, Netherlands. And then these uh, bigger and, and more long-term effects that we have, uh, so that housing market, the, the rules, standards, uh, even the urban planning uh, practices that were mentioned uh, early this morning as well. But at the same time, also maybe some loans that are given for the, uh, for the new families to um, have a, your own house and so on. So there are differences. And also, of course, time uh, in integration plays a huge, huge role to make a new, new network in a new society, uh, kind of maybe even getting some new um, contacts uh, among uh, locals and so on. Uh, so why did I choose um, the welfare states? Um, I think it's a really good example because uh, they really uh, push people or the, their idea is to treat everybody equally. But, and, uh, and this is also something that they will do also in tenure types and also housing mixing, which was also mentioned uh, earlier, uh, for example, uh, Finland case. But at the same time, there has been a lot of uh, studies uh, uh, studies on that uh, maybe this kind of uh, uh, really helping and kind of uh, uh, treating everybody equally and, and this might even uh, produce or, or reproduce uh, uh, this kind of segregation because everybody is kind of, they feel quite well even in the poorest neighborhoods or, or not uh, in that really good uh, uh, um, quality housing or so, but, uh, but uh, the money that they are given or, or this kind of uh, um, lactations are quite good and yeah, it's it maybe better than in home country. Uh, but at the same time, even though they are all, uh, the general idea is uh, welfare and treating everybody equally, then there are still some differences in the housing system. So, for example, in uh, Norway and, uh, and uh, Sweden, uh, and especially in Norway, there is a quite strong um, uh, separation between social... Uh, uh, between renting and owning, and in Norway they really uh, promote home ownership. But at the sa same time, uh, in Finland, for example, there is a really strong uh, uh, social mixing and, and uh, social housing is provided, and um, uh, they have a different uh, strategy for uh, social mixing. Uh, and in the end, uh, migrants are positioned differently in the housing market. Um, so, uh, a little bit numbers. <laughs> I'm a number girl. Uh, so, we can see here also that uh, uh, in uh, 2011, uh, the ownership in Oslo and also in uh, Stockholm 
is really, really high. So uh, single family houses and also this uh, cooperative uh, ownership is really high. But at the same time, Helsinki is uh, more focusing on, on renting and uh, uh, more than half of, uh, of uh, housing tenure types are renting. And, um, and this is um, already a graph uh, of the re results. Uh, we can see that um, where the uh, different uh, immigrant groups that I'm studying end up after the uh, study period. So in the uh, upper line, we can see uh, how the immigrants are, are spread into home ownership. So the yellower the color is, the more home ownership uh, there is and immigrants are living there. And, uh, and uh, when it's uh, purple or blue, then uh, it's the other way. So there is a lot of uh, immigrants renting a uh, renting place. So we can see already that there are differences. So for Stockholm cases, uh, uh, more uh, spread in a bigger scale that that uh, ownership is in outer skirt of uh, Stockholm and inner city is more renting. Uh, immigrants are renting there. Uh, Helsinki is quite mixed, <laughs> and uh, and also Oslo is quite orange or yellow with with uh, terminating. Uh, more complex is the lower uh, lower one line that we can see. Um, so basically, the the scale is about also the income level in different neighborhoods. So if it's um, uh, 60 percentile or higher income compared to the whole uh, city. Uh, then this is uh, considered as a rich neighborhood. And uh, for that, it's quite, uh, quite uh, I must say, evenly for, for the whole three cities. But for example, uh, for Helsinki, we can see that uh, in East, there are more, more blue colors uh, than, uh, than on the West. So yeah, um, about my model, I just uh, simply kind of had given the study group, the people, the immigrants who are starting their housing and neighborhood career in poor neighborhood and as a renter. And uh, I kind of look for uh, the three options that they have uh, to to their housing career. So they might, uh, might go from, from poor neighborhood to rich neighborhood, but will be still uh, renters. Then there is the option of, um, of uh, staying in a poor neighborhood, or yes, uh, moving from one location to the other, but the status of the neighborhood itself is still uh, dominating poor people, but they will go to ownership. And then the uh, third one, kind of the most idealistic, or maybe this kind of uh, 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 getting the most closest to the locals, is, uh, is this going for a rich neighborhood and uh, going for the ownership. Um, and uh, um, this, uh, this kind of study was based on, on Finland, uh, Sweden and Norway population uh, uh, register data. And uh, I, was, uh, I was able to include all the migrants and all the population, which I'm really proud of. Um, and, um, and we differed the, the immigrant groups, like I mentioned in the research question as well. So basically, we compare th three groups. So the high-income countries, uh, basically mainly these are the Western countries, 
then there is a group of belonging to low, uh, low middle or upper middle uh, income uh, uh, category. And then the, these kind of Eastern European countries, um, so-called uh, uh, latest EU members, uh, um, members uh, countries, for example, Estonia, and so on. Um, so let's go to the results. So first, uh, I wanted to get an answer if uh, this um, income is even related to um, income increase is related to the uh, to the exit of residential disadvantage, going closer to uh, natives, and yes, <laughs> uh, luckily uh, for for all the all the groups and for the, all the cities, uh, there is a strong uh, a strong relationship. Uh, between it. So basically, uh, after a while living in, in this new country, uh, they will increase their uh, income, and especially Stockholm is, uh, um, is uh, showing that uh, the probability of staying in low income neighborhood and uh, staying in rental uh, tenure type is very negative. So basically, they escape it, uh, this kind of residential disadvantage. Uh, it's not so uh, clearly seen in, in Helsinki and uh, for the Ho Oslo case, but still it's negative. So basically, all, all the immigrant uh, groups and for the all cities, they still try to move out of it. Um, oops. And then, uh, if we look, uh, so where where do they go? So they escape from where they began their uh, career in housing and, and neighborhood. But uh, what what kind of uh, strategies or tractors they took? We see that, uh, for example, if we go for the uh, high income uh, immigrants in, in in there we can see that uh, that uh, it's uh, it's negative uh, probability that they will will go to high income neighborhood but uh, but uh, st will be still uh, be renting and this is something that uh, came out of also from the uh, housing market uh, graph that uh, Basically, there isn't uh, so many options for rentings. Uh, that's why it's quite negative. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite... And for the Helsinki, it's still the other way. So basically, uh, all uh, immigrant groups coming from poor, coming from new EU, coming from high-income countries, uh, they might go to might go to high-income neighborhoods where there are more locals, but at the same time, they will still keep uh, renting because this is also what uh, the market offers for us in, in Helsinki. Uh, but uh, when we look at the, um, the ownership line, which is in the, in the bottom, we can see that uh, uh, Stockholm in Stockholm, immigrants are really, really the, the probability of moving to high-income neighborhoods and uh, moving to owner, owner, home ownership is really, really high. And uh, it, it is not so clear for the Helsinki and Oslo in that case. But at the same time, we can see that most probably uh, in Helsinki and Oslo, uh, they might go to, especially for the Oslo, they might go to a uh, low-income neighborhood and uh, go for the own ownership. So, what are the key takeaways? So, basically, um, the strategies um, are different. Um, 
and uh, they come because of the of the market that, that they are uh, dealing with and uh, this this kind of I was also really struggling because I'm coming from Estonia. This home ownership is like really something that everybody is dreaming, uh, and uh, this is their like wish to have to be a single family uh, home owner. But uh, the importance is actually different, and. Um, and uh, this uh, spatial assimilation, therefore, is uh, context uh, dependent. And uh, we can see that uh, it's not only the income that, uh, that improves uh, uh, this kind of housing conditions and, and the context that you will have. Uh, this, uh, this is not the case. Uh, there are also some other issues maybe to deal with before just giving a raise for the old uh, immigrants, for example, or kind of... Uh, but it is something to, to still consider, like helping them to get more equal uh, to, the, uh, to the locals. Um, yes, and, um, and uh, there are still like really strong relationships between the ownership and uh, where do you really uh, go for. So if you are still going for quite, um, quite disadvantaged neighborhood and uh, it's the only place where you can uh, buy a, a flat or a, or a house, then does it really solve for the integration if uh, all the other neighbors are also with that same background and and uh, kind of uh, struggling uh, the same way or is it uh, more about uh, also kind of uh, mixing uh, the tenure types in neighborhoods and mixing the kind of uh, people who are living in in these neighborhoods so thank you <laughs> Please go on, hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Karin. And I would now like to invite the other panel members to have a seat here as well, so we can start the discussion. And I can see that that some of the audience have already sent some questions. So evidently, many people are also eager to know more. But firstly, I would like to invite the audience present here to, to open with questions. If there is something someone wants to ask right away, so please, let's go with the audience questions. Okay. If you still want to think about them, so there's nothing burning right now. So then we can go with the online questions and some others. And please feel free to raise your hand and, and ask questions when you feel the need to. Um, firstly, I'd like to go to, to your presentation, Judith. You spoke very convincingly also about the, the meaning of inclusive policies and and how important they are for for integration. But do you, can you think of some examples where, why, and how, and where these kind of inclusive policies might also perhaps have unintended consequences, or or is there a risk that they can backfire? How do you see on this point? Um. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I guess that's relevant for many people also in the audience. Um, what we see in our findings and also in some previous literature that looked at actual policies and the relationship with attitudes, we do not see a backlash. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the more inclusive policies were very consistently related to more positive attitudes. At the same time, there is a literature, mostly in the United States, that looks at what happens when people are told that ethnic minorities or immigrants would receive 
more equal rights, special favors, and so on. So it's more a discourse about, uh, about granting favors, about granting equality. And there you can see um, in other people's research that that might result in a backlash, that might result in perceptions, feelings of threat being heightened. And the way out of it is what the, the American literature calls all-inclusive multiculturalism. So a way to approach multiculturalism, to approach policies that also include um, the majority population and that also keeps their, their rights, their um, cultural position, um, well, not intact, but uh, high enough. Um, and that would, that would uh, not exacerbate these feelings of threat. Thank you. That's, I think, a very important point, point in, in, in these policy considerations. Maybe if we then move, we'll, we can do this in order also in the, the questions that I have been thinking when you have been presenting. If we, from this move then to, to you, Patrick, you talk a lot about kind of negative and positive contact and I think many of us, I'm also a geographer by background, so, so maybe to social psychologists these concepts are, are very familiar and of course you gave a lot of examples, but could you expand a little bit on, on what is meant by this contact and also I, I, I was left kind of wondering about negative contact, that, that what does that cause and kind of, could you expand a little bit on that as well please? Yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, I guess also where the intergroup contact literature comes from, also it comes from the um, kind of American context where um, basically the father of the intergroup contact hypothesis saw segregation in the American society and felt, well, actually what we need is contact. We need to kind of talk to each other uh, and get people together. Um, but already early on, um, it was said contact is good or has good consequences uh, when the conditions are right. And this is why I'm really glad uh, to also have you guys here on the panel where we're also talking about these different conditions such as um, segregation, reduced segregation, equal policies, because this is exactly um, what already Alpha kind of suggested that the conditions need to be right for contact to be positive and exert positive consequences. But when you also look at the um, American context, for instance, um, and, and look, for instance, at slavery, um, white slave owners and, 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 and uh, black slaves, they had loads and loads of contact, right? Um, uh, over long periods of time, but that didn't change anything, right? Um, so this just means that the context <coughs> needs, to be, um, needs to be right. But something that has then been uh, neglected in the research itself, it kind of just, just looked at quantity of contact, quantity of contact. And only in recent years, researchers kind of had this awakening. Well, actually, we are, were also looking at optimal contact in the literature, but there's also this negative side of contact, which is um, actually also increasing discrimination and, and prejudice. And um, there's indeed some literature that suggests that positive contact in general is more frequent, but when we engage in negative encounters, um, then this is actually then, or might be even a little bit more influential. Um, so although positive contact prevails and is more quantitatively more frequent, um, negative contact, when it happens, might have also very detrimental consequences. And this is uh, basically, I guess, uh, why I was also interested, so, so if you allow me to yes. just uh, maybe um, already address a question to you, because I've also found your talk very fascinating. And you said that basically, um, or that's how I understood your talk, um, that you had, uh, we're looking at the diversity and segregation, and you could also show this very nice trend of increasing positive intergroup contact in the, uh, basically in these contexts, right? So I was just wondering, did you also have negative intergroup contact in your data, and did you, what were the findings, if so? Yeah, um, no, the, it, it's an excellent question, and then unfortunately not, it was, it was a situation where, I think the kind of <laughs> the survey we were working on predates 
the moment where people started to kind of be interested in negative intergroup contact. So it was unfortunately just, yeah, just a situation whereby we had positive. But I think it, you're absolutely right in, in that probably these segregated environments are more likely not only to reduce positive contact, but probably increase negative contact as well. And um, I, would, I wonder if um, perhaps when you have a situation where groups are separate and segregated and they view each other as more different, is that like the, what are the conditions of negative contact, I suppose, is the question, right? And um, if you have it in a segregated environment, is that optimal conditions for negative contact? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it would be interesting to look at. And these are, I think you're really in the heart also of segregation research here <laughs> as well. Because, of course, one of the kind of complexities of segregation is that, that we do know that it very often reflects deep inequalities within the society. So, so when you have high levels of segregation, it's rather likely that there are other types of inequalities playing out in the city. Maybe perhaps then relating to Judith again to your talk that, that when we have higher levels of inequality, likelihood is that there's a lot of income differences. So these unequal contacts in other domains also besides the segregation. So maybe through that, I would also like to ask both of you actually, James and Patrick, maybe you touched upon this just to quickly before then moving to you, Karin, that how do you think that, that or, or have you found evidence on how to enhance positive contact then in these segregated places? Is, is there a way to somehow foster and, and encourage positive contact? Um, yeah, so, so at, least, at least from some of the work uh, I've been doing outside of this, um, it's, it's quite intractable, especially for young people where we have these segregated areas because we don't, not only do we have lack of opportunities in people's neighborhoods, but for young people, at least in a lot of countries where schooling catchment areas basically structure the ethnically diverse, the ethnic diversity of their schools, you have essentially hyper segregation, young people really isolated. So one thing we looked at was um, the role of civic participation, like youth engagement, youth volunteering, uh, and where these kinds of groups can actually act as a bridge maybe mm. between like segregated worlds. And the, the work we did was actually, it actually found very strongly that not only that young people who kind of took part in this civic engagement, not only did their contact increase, but it had a particularly strong effect for young people coming from segregated environments. So essentially these young people who normally had no opportunities, when they kind of joined these uh, youth civic engagement programs, it provided essentially in many ways their first chances for positive contact and had a much, much stronger effect for those young people. And the nice thing about the kind of youth engagement programs, I, th I think, is that a lot of the issues with segregation are very intractable. I mean, you know, as you were just saying, Venla, there's often quite strong socioeconomic, socioeconomic inequalities behind this. It's actually quite hard to reduce segregation. So in the shorter term, creating these kind of civic spaces mm. really serve as a kind of wonderful opportunity, I think, to provide contact where otherwise it wouldn't exist. Yes, thank you. And continuing on this, exactly how to reduce segregation, then Karin, I, I think your wonderful presentation also very much fed into the kind of question of what can be done and about policies. For example, for the Swedish case, I remember Roger Andersson, a segregation researcher also from Sweden, saying that that according to estimates of the Uppsala Research Institute, that they estimate that around 70% of segregation caused in Stockholm is based and rooted in the housing policies, so just the structure of housing. So it's the tenure type, what we build and where, that then 
kind of introduces these patterns, how inequalities then play out in space. So how do you see the role of housing policies maybe also in these attempts to desegregate, also in the case of Estonia, but the Nordic countries as well? I see that, um, and that was also mentioned uh, quite strongly uh, earlier today as well, that uh, I think uh, there is a lot that we can learn from uh, Finland, so just across the sea, <laughs> uh, about this uh, social mixing in, in different, different uh, fields. So not just only putting uh, people into different neighborhoods, but also giving them the chance uh, to have these different uh, housing types uh, within the neighborhood itself as well. And, uh, and Finland is really, really trying that. Uh, and uh, it is shown in, in the results as well that that seems to be working. And, uh, there is no need to explain why is it uh, important because in uh, but uh, they are quite uh, understandable already but still i want to want to um, uh, bring the attention to all all these kind of uh, um, these kind of things that are within the neighborhood so schools uh, where the children go to school what kind of people are or students are there what kind of uh, uh, like uh, studying style or what kind of vision they have uh, uh, there as well and this kind of uh, like is mentioned we can we have to focus on the young uh, young people and uh, this is the future of us so basically giving the good uh, good housing uh, policies, giving all the good, uh, good quality uh, uh, education uh, is, uh, is the, the places where we can, we can do something and uh, it is something that uh, uh, we here in Estonia discuss a lot as well. So uh, I think we are on the right way, <laughs> but there are a lot to do still. Thank you. And on a very similar note, there's also a question from the online audience directly to James on these very same lines. So the question is related, to what extent does your research lead to policy recommendations to actually steer residency, perhaps even by government authority? So I, as far as I understand, also asking about the sort of housing policies and perhaps the selection of people also within the kind of social housing sector and, and that mm. mixing. How do no. you see it on the, that? Yeah, it's so... So the, the, based on the research, I think there are clear policy implications that reducing segregation should, especially in diverse environments, diverse cities, should have this positive um, impact on people's attitudes. At least that should kickstart a development, I suppose, over time of reduced prejudice. Um, uh, the kinds of policies, that's a fascinating one because, yeah, I mean, I think people have been trying to kind of reduce segregation for, for a long time. And I wish, I wish I had a good answer for everybody, um, but, I think, I think one of the interesting things, at least from the, the UK contact, uh, context, is that people are very aware when they feel they are being, I had to say, manipulated into doing something they wouldn't normally want to do. So there's been a lot of work which shows that if you try and force people to have contact, for example, based on the idea that it'll be good for them, it'll reduce their prejudice, they're very aware of this and they become very guarded and very defensive about it and actually ends up having um, the opposite effect. So when it comes to something like segregation, I think explicitly developing policies whereby you are saying we need to increase the ethnic mix, you need to be more mixed for the betterment of you and for society, people will become very guarded of that. Instead, what you need to do is address some of the kind of causes perhaps around increasing segregation, perceptions of this. So in, in the UK, there are still perceptions that um, 
ethnically diverse schools may be less successful than more ethnically uh, white British schools. There is also some interesting work which shows people are more likely to move out of their neighborhoods when uh, Pakistani populations move in because of perceptions that their house prices are going to decline. So, so these are not explicitly related to um, prejudice per se, but they're related to things like uh, the, their, their children's education or their financial resources or things like this. And so if you can start to perhaps address these things, it's not a, um, a, not a cure-all for it, but you can address then, I think, some of the um, issues around the drivers of segregation without people becoming averse to the idea of mixing, let's say. Yes, and we go also deeper into those issues then on the next panel, also on education about, for example, these in educational inequalities. So, but I, I think these are very key issues and kind of continuing on this theme, there's also in the audience questions, as well as my own note questions, to actually all of you, the question of differences between different ethnic groups or immigrant groups in the sense that, that also in the audience it was pointed out that people's attitudes actually across European countries seems to vary quite a lot to different groups. And many of you mentioned also these different categories, such as people who are, are perceived as refugees or then the lower human development index kind of countries and, and how people relate to that. So, so how do you see that this plays out? in the questions of, of integration and housing careers. If we this time start from you, Karin, and, and move in the panel. That, yeah, that, that was a really, it is a really good question. And uh, I actually had the same question when you did uh, presented uh, your work, because I guess uh, when you show the Estonian case, then um, I think there is a really strong difference whether it's uh, it's um, like these um, IT boys coming or boys and girls coming from uh, different countries to Tallinn and kind of uh, doing that, <laughs> and then the long-term uh, migrants uh, from Soviet time coming here and having their life here and already like uh, multiple uh, like generations here so the the attitude to it towards uh, these kind of different immigrant groups uh, is really really different and uh, and uh, this is why context is so important and uh, and uh, these kind of uh, over european uh, studies are really good but at the same time, there is a lot of uh, to study for each country itself as well. So I think uh, here in Estonia, there is a really strong uh, difference. And, and before the war in Ukraine, there were quite uh, racist uh, like stories, uh, even in the newspapers that uh, well, it's not so bad after all to have these uh, Russian neighbors uh, when we have all these kind of uh, black people or different cultural people coming here. So kind of this, um, these uh, stories came, to, uh, came here as well, but, uh, and there is a difference. If we move this way then to James? Yeah. I it, it's, a, it's an excellent point. There are big differences both in people's attitudes towards different migrant groups, and I mean, not just migrant groups, we're talking like second, third, fourth generation ethnic minorities in countries. And there's also big differences in the experiences of groups, big differences in levels of discrimination, and big differences in levels of segregation. And so when we talk about segregation, of ethnic minorities, we often find some groups, it's much, much lower, lower than others. And, and I think, you know, for all of us, kind of going forward, it's uh, trying to understand why these dynamics differ, for example, for different ethnic groups. And, and I think at the same time, uh, you know, also understanding that 
you know, certain groups have stronger cultural identities and stronger ethnic identities than others, and there's greater and lesser distances between um, the majority group and minority groups, and all these kinds of factors, I suppose, playing a role um, in, you know, in, in how groups are perceived, accepted, discriminated against, uh, but also segregated as well. And I think also the, the way how you dealt with the, this neighborhood segregation, it's also very relevant to that, that, that we do have two different kinds of patterns of ethnic segregation quite often. One is these sort of mono-ethnic enclaves, like the North American cases of kind of Chinatown or Little Italy, where the socioeconomic structure can be very different also within that community, and mm. it's more of a cultural enclave in a way. Whereas here in European cities, we mostly tend to see these multi-ethnic enclaves, which then have a very low socioeconomic status as well, and, and kind of relative disadvantage coupled in this. So I think this is also maybe a point that has a lot to do to do with how then these are perceived. But I, I, I think your talk very strongly really even relates to these multi, or I mean mono-ethnic enclaves. That do, do you see them also? These could, like little Italy, create barriers, even though it's not a concentration of disadvantage? Y yes. So, um, so, I, so one thing we, we have done is, so in the UK, um, we obviously the Muslim population in the UK is one of the most segregated groups, mm. and so you oftentimes find, and, and also one of the most socioeconomically disadvantaged groups as well. And so you often find very kind of high density, segregated but mono ethnic yeah. enclaves, as you yes. say. Um, so there's a the kind of question: is as well, well. Is it, these, is it the spatial distribution which matters? Is it the segregation which matters of these areas? Or is it the fact that there's a lot of negative discourses around these groups as well? Uh, but what we found is that actually the spatial distribution of just the Muslim population really matters. Yeah. So say you have an area which is 50% Muslim and everybody's very concentrated, the attitudes of white British people in those areas are much more negative. Mm. Whereas if you have the same 50% Muslim in particular, but equally spread out, residentially integrated, attitudes are much, much more better. So even within like an ethnic group like that, how it's distributed really seems to matter for people. Yes, and the UK is, is a very interesting case also because of these mono-ethnic enclaves that, that also appear somewhat in, in some other kind of central European cities. Whereas in, in many cities, you just tend to find a very kind of ethnically mixed, but socioeconomically disadvantaged. That, mm -hmm. that is very interesting. But moving then to you, Patrick, how do you see on this kind of different groups and how, how they are met in the question of... Yeah, um, I also think it's an excellent question. And um, so something that has been su suggested in the literature that, um, as uh, James has also um, already said, that we perceive some groups more positively than others. And um, actually, by perceiving some people more positively than others, something that happens um, is kind of a valence matching um, effect, if you will, also with intergroup context. So something that has been suggested is, if I have a negative stereotype about a group and then have a matching experience, so a negative experience, then this is going to have a larger effect than if I have a negative stereotype about a group and then have a positive experience. So then it might be much, much, it might, then positive contact might be as a disadvantage if I have negative stereotypes. Whereas it's the other way around uh, for positively perceived groups. So if I have a positive experience with a positively um, perceived group, um, uh, then uh, just having one negative encounter won't change my worldview or basically my, my views much about the group. So, um, and this is how also contact, and, and this is also how, how the work um, it can be so cumbersome, right? So when we have already existing negative stereotypes to kind of stir the boat uh, into the other direction, um, to increase uh, cohesion. So it's a very good question, and I guess that's the challenge that we're all facing. Mm. Thank you.
Um, what about you? What I can add to what my colleagues was, were saying is, uh, is a bit of a historical perspective, because we didn't say it loud, but the, the immigrant groups who are most stigmatized in most countries are the immigrant groups who are racialized. So people who are not white, not of European origin, but who have come through labor migration from the Mediterranean or through post-colonial migration in former colonizing countries. And I think that's, uh, that's crucial to understand why we, why we hold more negative attitudes towards these group of migrants. I think even in those countries that were not colonizers themselves, I come from Hungary myself, we didn't have any colonies, Estonia was not a colonizing country, but the perceptions, the representations of people from the former colonies, they still permeate how we see, um, how we see people coming from, uh, from outside Europe. And these are representations that hold in some ways until today. Um, I, I know the, the migration context the best in Belgium, where I've been working for a long time. And there you can really see this difference because in the 40s, 50s, first uh, migrant laborers were recruited from Italy and Portugal, uh, from the poorest regions, that's why they came. Um, but at the time, the economy was going better. These people are also white and European, so they were, they were afforded more social mobility. And the second and third generation who live in Belgium today of Italian origin, you cannot differentiate them on any of the socioeconomic indicators. There's been a prime minister of Italian origin in Belgium. At the same time, if you look at the next generation of labor migrants who came after them, who, are, who, are, who were recruited, invited from Turkey and Morocco, um, and the post-colonial migration from Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, who also came after independence, um, the, the attitudes are still very different. And it's the second and third generation growing up in Belgium, but all of their indicators, socioeconomic status, segregation, attitudes, they are much worse. So I think race, being a racialized minority, is, uh, it's crucial here. I also, I'm, as an Eastern European immigrant, I know myself that there are negative attitudes towards Eastern Europeans in Western Europe, but it's a lot less dire than what, uh, what racialized immigrants are facing. Thank you. And I think these are crucial points also, understanding these kind of intersections, that there is the socioeconomic level, then all different questions of perceptions and racialization and, and so on. There's a wonderful question, kind of continuing this to a slightly different sphere, to the world without geography in a way. Um, there have been two questions of borderless communication, social media and so on, which is one domain kind of outside our geographical existence in many ways. Of course, tied also to local issues, we have a lot of neighborhood discussion groups and so on, which and, and people who are closer to each other tend to be better connected, but still it's a kind of world without boundaries. So how do you reflect on that? Um, how, has it changed the way how people are in contact with each other? Can it, can it affect integration? And how do you see it in relation to your own research? Anyone can pick up on this. I see many nodding. <laughs> <laughs> um, first thought that came to my mind is that uh, this uh, social network and so on, it's really good in a perspective of for the immigrants to stay still in contact uh, with your own people who are left behind. Uh, so therefore kind of like not losing your identity in this uh, huge uh, new country where everybody is pushing you to the integration. So uh, this, this is something really good to have this kind of contact and, and, and not losing yourself uh, uh, in a new context. Mm. But the, do, do others want to comment also? Are people included or is there a contact between groups also in social media? If I may yes, chip in. yes, anybody can um, pick up. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so there's also work on intergroup contact over different kind of modes. Um, so there's all kind of um, 
like online contact and so on and so forth. And there's a huge potential here as well. But um, I think we're also all aware of these echo gem chambers, right? Um, so you can also easily, or algorithms, let, okay, let's not just give the, uh, the fault to Mark Zuckerberg and, and colleagues, um, but algorithms and, and due to other factors, uh, people who might have a certain worldview might actually also be only communicating with a certain uh, worldview and um, see themselves reinforced. Uh, which can then have actually um, the exact opposite consequences. So um, we might, this of course then has the potential to then polarize instead of bringing us together. So I guess that it's also a huge challenge and I think um, the time left here will, will not really allow us to elaborate a lot uh, about these challenges, but um, yes, there's great potential, um, but also many dangers. Thank you. Is there now someone in the audience who would like to ask a question? Or shall we? Yes, there is a question here. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity and then the wonderful um, discussion. Um, as the High Commissioner was saying, like the challenge for us is also to think about like what what can we learn for like actually policies, for example, here in Estonia. And for me, like uh, uh, as a relatively new person, I've been coming to Estonia since a long time and living now in Tallinn. For me, like this city still feels quite as a segregated city. Uh, you know much more about it than, than, than I do. And my question would be like, what would be your advice to like policymakers here in Tallinn or in Estonia? Because I mean, like, uh, like, like your graph, I'm really surprised like, how strong this impact can be, this physical segregation. And, and to give a small context, um, in the Dutch society, there is a strong tradition of like very strong top-down policies by the government on, for example, social housing, where the government says like certain neighborhoods should have at least 30% social housing. The big downside of it is that the government can also decide to diminish the number from 30 to 40 or 20. In, my city, Rotterdam, where I come from, the city is now demolishing social housing blocks, big blocks, and replacing them by, uh, by, by uh, higher income housing. So my question would be, what would be your advice for the city of Tallinn to increase uh, level of integration uh, of, and the physical integration of different housing types? Should the city do that, or is this kind of laissez-faire policy does it also have its positive sides because it's for people themselves to decide how they want to grow socially, economically in the city? Uh, I think the issue, or maybe it's a good or bad, at the same time bad, but uh, basically uh, in Estonia the, uh, the housing is quite liberal. So after the Soviet uh, uh, collapse of Soviet Union, uh, uh, in Soviet time, nobody owned, and then uh, one moment uh, you can own uh, your your apartment or this kind of. So basically, uh, unfortunately, maybe the the government hands are too short uh, to kind of um, to play around with these different housings and so on. Or at least so far, it has been so that because uh, people own and rent their selves. Not, uh, there are so few social housing uh, types uh, in Estonia. So this is uh, something to consider, maybe uh, taking a, a role back to the government itself and, and govern uh, this housing. And uh, I think this is something uh, that uh, they should do. <laughs> yeah. um, if I may, just yeah. I think one thing to potentially be aware of is um, so, uh, there's been a lot of interesting kind of dynamics in, in UK cities whereby one idea of um, say better integrating socially, but also you know ethnically as well, is through investment investment in an area. Um, and investment in new housing as well. But sometimes that's had the kind of opposite effect of if you make an area too attractive, then 
all of a sudden, you're not just encouraging people to move in, but landlords begin to see an opportunity there. And then rents begin to raise, and then the original inhabitants, I mean, this is like a classic process, um, they begin not to be able to afford that. And so they then have to move out. And in many ways, you have an area which looks better, but you've just displaced the segregation, both socioeconomic and ethnic as well, to like the outskirts. So it's, yeah, it's not, it's not a, what we can do, but what we have to be careful, <laughs> I suppose. It's true, and I guess it, it speaks for the exactly Karin's point also on the social housing, because of course in social housing, the rents are controlled, so, so people do not get displaced within that housing stock. But that the question of gentrification, I think, is extremely timely, both in Tallinn and, and in many other cities with relatively low numbers of, of kind of socially controlled housing units. That's a very good point. But I think we could continue this discussion until tomorrow. That there are still plenty of questions, but but I think that the smells of lunch are slowly starting <laughs> to to kind of pierce through. So maybe we'll go just for the last round of your kind of closing. If you still think that that you have something you'd like to crystallize to the end of the discourse now, so so please, if we start by you, Judith. The, final wisdom before lunch. <laughs> I would just like to repeat my conclusion that the key to lower xenophobia and less tension is giving immigrants more equal rights and not the opposite. Yeah. Worth repeating. <laughs> and uh, I might just add that intergroup contact is good if it's um, a positive contact and has many, many different consequences which are positive, not only um, it's going to help us to reduce prejudice towards groups, but has also other very beneficial societal consequences. Um, I think I'd, I'd just like to briefly say we can tend to get very uh, bogged down in the negative sides of things, mm -hmm. but I would say the moral arc of, of the, the universe, as Martin Luther King said, is long, but it bends towards justice, and things are getting better. If you take somebody... Now, in the UK, for example, and from the past, and you took them to the UK now, they would not believe how ethnically diverse it is. But still, it works. So I would say the longer-term processes uh, are really towards positive. doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything to kind of uh, help them on their way or protect them when tensions do arise, but I would, I'm optimistic, let's say. <laughs> Thank you, James. And uh, I think I, I would even... Uh, would, would say that uh, it's not only the issue of, of um, these uh, uh, of people, but it's also uh, something that uh, really the government uh, should consider. For example, I just uh, uh, yesterday came from uh, uh, like um, conference about uh, will to defence. And, uh, and uh, there was also this said, uh, it's not only about the, the giving better uh, quality of life uh, for the immigrants, but it's, it is something to uh, think about for the uh, countries as well, that uh, we don't want them to, to be alike, but uh, we want them to think uh, uh, or consider that their new home as something to protect and uh, this is something to think and, uh, and uh, consider. Thank you all so much for the panel and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here together with the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.